Good, good morning and good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to uh, the event co-organized by the Interparliamentary Union, uh, SCAP and UNIC on the enhancing the role of parliaments in accelerating the achievement of the SDGs, uh, taking forward the UN General Assembly resolution. Uh, today, we'll have a special focus on SDG 7, Affordable and Clean Energy and its interlinked goals. Uh, we are warmly welcoming all the parliamentarians and distinguished representatives uh, from ESCAP and EC member states from, from around the world. Um, we are very pleased that this has become uh, a tradition uh, to get together in this webinar format and discuss the most topical issues that bring parliamentarians from around uh, the world together. Uh, We're also uh, very pleased to have uh, distinguished uh, speakers with us today who I will introduce later. Uh, my name is Dmitry Mariasin. I'm the Deputy Executive Secretary of the UN Economic Commission for Europe, UNICE, and I have the, the honor to moderate uh, today's discussion. I'd like to start um, uh, by introducing uh, the very distinguished uh, panel we have for the opening uh, segment today. And, and let me uh, first turn to uh, His Excellency Mr. Martin Chungong, the IPU uh, Secretary General, for his welcome remarks. Sir, the floor is yours. I thank you very much, uh, Dimitri, for giving me the floor. Uh, I think I saw Amida somewhere, uh, uh, but I cannot see her anymore. But I wish to recognize her presence at this meeting, as well as uh, my colleague Olga Algayerova, Executive Secretary of the UN Economic uh, Commission for Africa for Europe. Uh, honorable members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome you to this uh, webinar, which we are jointly organizing with the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, the ECE, and the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, ESCAP. This event follows up on the 2022 UN General Assembly Resolution on enhancing the role of parliaments in accelerating the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the first ever to focus solely on the role of parliaments in implementing the SDGs, a topic that represents one of the key policy areas of the Interparliamentary Union. We are very grateful to Uzbekistan, the initiator of the resolution for its strong commitment and for having mobilized more than 80 UN member states to sponsor the resolution. The resolution recognizes the essential role parliaments play in bringing the SDGs to life through their powers to legislate, budget, and scrutinize government action. And it clearly demonstrates government's openness to enhance cooperation with parliaments to fully implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I'm very proud that through the IPU 2022-26 strategy, member parliaments have reiterated their political commitment to sustainable development and have collectively decided that action towards the achievement of the SDGs should be prioritized over the five years covered by the strategy. Honorable members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, we are at a critical juncture in our human history. According to the latest report of the United Nations, the SDGs are badly off track. Under current trends, by 2030, only about one third of countries will meet the target to halve national poverty levels. And shockingly, the number of people facing hunger and food insecurity could increase. 286 years would still be required to close the gender gap in legal protection 
and remove discriminatory laws. Concerning climate change, current actions to address the crisis are insufficient. In fact, carbon dioxide levels continue to rise to a level not seen in 2 million years. The overall picture is deeply concerning, and it is the developing countries and the world's poorest and most vulnerable people that are paying the highest price. We look, if we look at the voluntary national review VNR process, a process in which parliaments should definitely be involved, considering their critical oversight role, we unfortunately observe that a lot more should be done. According to our analysis, in 2022, of the 42 countries that submitted the VNI report, only 16 mentioned parliaments as active contributors. Ladies and gentlemen, I like to think that behind any problem lies an opportunity in disguise. UN General Assembly Resolution 77-159, which is at the center of our discussions today, explicitly encourages member states to promote the engagement and support of parliaments in the follow-up and review processes on SDGs, particularly in the preparation of the VNRs. Parliaments should not miss this opportunity to use the resolution to enhance dialogue and cooperation with the executive branch. Data does point to progress in some areas such as on SDG 7, a goal that will be reviewed in depth at the high level political forum this year on affordable and clean energy and on access to electricity, the latter which had increased from 87% for the global population in 2015 to 91% in 2021. Nevertheless, more access to affordable and clean energy remains critical for tracking the climate crisis and accelerating sustainable development. Parliaments and parliamentarians are uniquely positioned to facilitate a clean energy transition and ensure that policies, plans, and budgets are fully aligned with the SDGs. They must lead by example before preaching to the people. The IPU's new campaign, Parliament for the Planet, encourages them to take action to reduce the carbon footprint of their parliaments by changing day-to-day -day behavior, improving the energy efficiency of their buildings, and reducing carbon emissions. Action for climate and sustainable development be begins at home and should not stop there. It should further develop also through this type of events that offer an important opportunity to enhance parliamentary dialogue, coordination, and cooperation. The IPU offers technical assistance on these issues. If this might be of interest, do not hesitate to contact our office to discuss how this support could be organized and tailored to your specific context. Honorable members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, it is my hope that you will use this privileged forum to benefit from the expertise of invited keynote speakers, share your views with your peers and discuss how you can help implement the UN resolution so as to accelerate the achievement of all SDGs in a balanced, coherent, and integrated manner. I wish you a constructive discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, uh, for your welcoming remarks. I'd like to now uh, turn to the video message uh, of Her Excellency Ms. Armida Sancia and Mr. Shadwana, UN Under Secretary General and USCAP Executive Secretary, um, asking the team to please play the video. 
Honorable Speakers and Members of Parliament, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar for parliamentarians in Europe and in Asia and the Pacific. We are very pleased to organize this event in collaboration with the Inter-Parliamentary Union and our sister regional commission for Europe. Energy is key to driving economic growth, improving livelihoods, and reducing poverty. At the same time, energy has brought to humanity one of the greatest threats, climate change, which is largely driven by the burning of fossil fuels to generate energy. SCAPS 2023 Asia and Pacific Sustainable Development Goals Progress Report indicates that among all goals, progress towards goals set 7 has been the greatest in the Asia Pacific region. This progress has been largely driven by achievements in access to electricity and international support for clean and renewable energy. However, Little progress has been made today in increasing the share of renewable energy consumption. In fact, the region is responsible for half of the world's annual energy consumption and nearly 54% of fuel-related carbon emissions. Compared with other regions, Asia and the Pacific has higher energy intensity while its share of modern renewable energy is lower. On the bright side, many countries are emerging as renewable energy leaders, particularly in areas such as green hydrogen, electric mobility, and cross-border renewable mega projects. Many also have already set targets to reach net zero emissions by mid-century. At ESCAP, we have supported the development of 16 national SDG 7 roadmaps. We have also worked with nine cities or provinces to develop subnational sustainable energy strategies. These roadmaps have served as the foundation for the development of national energy policies and plans to achieve SDG 7. Through targeted capacity building programs on integrated energy planning, countries have the capacity to navigate their energy transition through a systems approach exploring synergies between the provision of energy access, boosting shares of renewables, and enhancing energy efficiency. By identifying key areas for intervention and supportive policies, the roadmaps offer the opportunity for countries to set in place better enabling environments to attract private sector investments. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, to fully achieve SDG 7, we must strengthen effective collaboration and cooperation among all stakeholders. SDG 7 is at the heart of the 2030 Agenda. Fulfilling this goal will support the achievement of many other goals from climate change to poverty alleviation. However, transitioning the energy sector to achieve the SDGs requires long-term planning that is complemented by short- and medium-term actions. You as parliamentarians are uniquely positioned to shape climate and energy policy reforms, which in turn can lead to prioritizing investment in a cleaner future. As parliamentarians, you play a cardinal role in ensuring political support for a green and fair energy transition translating global climate and energy targets and commitments into national legislation. You can make a difference by demanding transparency and accountability and helping national governments enact those commitments into laws and budgets. Your role is key in raising awareness of the need for energy reforms to tackle the climate crisis and pave the way for more inclusive, resilient and sustainable Societies, I trust that the resolution on parliamentary engagement for the 2030 Agenda, adopted by the UN General Assembly last year, will become a guide for all parliamentarians, mobilizing efforts in the accelerated implementation of the SDGs. 
The resolution is also an important step towards the SDG Summit, which will be con convened in September of this year. The summit will be a key moment to find bold and transformative solutions, as well as political guidance on how to get back on track towards the achievement of the SDGs. I wish you a fruitful webinar, and I hope the discussions inspire stronger parliamentary action and chart a course towards a sustainable energy future through a just energy transition. Thank you very much. With many thanks to the Executive Secretary of UNSCAP, uh, I would like to now uh, pass the floor to Her Excellency, uh, the Under Secretary General, the UNEC Executive Secretary, Ms. Olga Gallerova. Uh, Olga, the floor is yours. Thank you, Deputy. Distinguished Secretary General of IPU, Mr. Martin Chungol, Excellencies, Members of Parliament, Distinguished Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen, it's really my great pleasure to address you today at this regional webinar on the role of parliaments in accelerating the achievement of the SDGs. Dear colleagues, we are halfway to 2030. The future we want seems to be still out of reach. In a world grappling with multiple crises, we are facing strong headwinds in advancing the implementation of the SDGs. And this is also the case in our region, in the 56 UN ECE member states in North America, Europe, Caucasus, and Central Asia. Our annual SDG progress report prepared for the 2023 Regional Forum on Sustainable Development reveals that the region is not only off track to achieve the 2030 Agenda, but in fact, progress has worsened since last year. The UNEC region is on track to achieve only 21 SDG targets by 2030, down from 26 last year, with 79 requiring accelerations and 15 requiring a reversal of trend. The SDG Summit in September will be a make or break moment for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. We must generate sustained and transformative actions at national and regional levels to rescue the SDGs and keep our promise of a sustainable future for all. UNEC supports countries in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda in several ways. We offer a platform for governments to cooperate and engage with all stakeholders on norms, standards, conventions. We are promoting a multi-sectoral approach to tackle the interconnected challenges of sustainable development in an integrated manner. And most of our work has a transboundary focus, which helps devise solutions to shared challenges. The United Nations Economic Commission for Europe is deeply engaged in the policy areas covered by this year's high-level political forum. Those are SDG 6, 7, 9, and 11. You will hear more about our work to build resilient and sustainable energy systems by our Director of Sustainable Division, Division later today in the discussion. SDG implementation requires a multi-stakeholder approach. The General Assembly resolution referred to in it, in this seminar, the calls for strength and cooperation among governments and parliaments. And this is where you, the members of parliaments, have a unique role as a direct and elected representatives of the people. You can ensure that all their voices are heard by the political decision makers. You can propose legislation to drive changes that advance the implementation of the SDGs. And you exercise oversight functions and provide information that helps governments better tailor national policies and the VNRs. To conclude, ultimately, dear colleagues, accelerating SDG progress requires a green, and digital transformation and 
important shift to circular economy that contributes to the sustainable management of natural resources and shapes a more resilient, prosperous and sustainable future for all. I call on your help in shaping this future. And finally, I wish you interesting and fruitful discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Algayerova, um, uh, for your welcoming remarks. This uh, concludes the, the opening segment of uh, today's event. Um, we, uh, we thank the distinguished Secretary General of IPU, the distinguished uh, Executive Secretaries of UN ASCAP and UNIC. And now um, we have the real honor to, to welcome the keynote speech by Her Excellency Ms. Tanzila Narbaeva, the Chairwoman of the Senate, from Uzbekistan. Uh, her keynote speech will set the scene for the discussion today. Uh, we uh, also uh, have noted the special role Uzbekistan has played in, um, in making this uh, General Assembly resolution a reality. And finally, we know Ms. Narbaeva is a, a true leader uh, with a track record in the government and uh, as Deputy Prime Minister from 2016 uh, to 2019 and of course, as uh, the uh, chairperson of the Senate of Uzbekistan since 2019, where she has been leading a transformational work um, uh, with the parliamentarians, uh, supporting the reform agenda in the country, as well as leading the important streams of work on women empowerment and many other topics. We are really honored that uh, she um, uh, was able to uh, produce this keynote speech for us. Um, we understand that due to competing commitments, she couldn't join in person and has re recorded uh, a video message, which I'm asking uh, the moderation team to please play now. Уважаемые участники мероприятия, дамы и господа, прежде всего позвольте поприветствовать всех участников сегодняшнего мероприятия. Пользуясь случаем, хочу выразить свою огромную признательность Межпарламентскому союзу, Организации Объединенных Наций и всем другим странам и международным организациям, поддержавшим инициативу Узбекистана о принятии резолюции Генеральной Ассамблеи ООН об усилении роли парламентов в ускорении достижения целей устойчивого развития. Безусловно, принятие резолюции является историческим достижением всех парламентов мира. Впервые в истории принят важный документ, в который подчеркивается решающая роль парламентов в реализации повестки дня в области устойчивого развития на период до 2030 года. Резолюция призывает государства, члены, выполнять задачи, определенные в 13 направлениях. В резолюции особая роль отводится национальным парламентам, которые наделены законотворческими контрольными и представительскими функциями. Именно они могут стимулировать развитие экономики, оказать влияние на эффективную реализацию социальной политики, обеспечить доступ к качественному здравоохранению, образованию, не оставляя никого позади. В целом, резолюция является своего рода путеводителем для парламентариев всего мира, который позволяет мобилизовать их усилия в контроле за осуществлением национальных индикаторов. Резолюция призывает государства, члены к сотрудничеству в подготовке добровольных национальных обзоров, которые являются одним из механизмов оценки прогресса в достижении целей устойчивого развития. В этом году Узбекистан представляет на политическом форуме ООН высокого уровня по устойчивому развитию свой второй добровольный национальный обзор, в подготовке которого приняли участие все заинтересованные стороны – правительство, парламент, гражданское общество, национальные и международные эксперты. Пользуясь случаем, выражаем отдельную благодарность команде твининг программы ИСКАТО, которые оказали практическое методологическое содействие в подготовке нашего национального обзора. В резолюции важное значение также отводится гендерной проблематике, участию женщин и молодежи в парламентах. В настоящее время в Узбекистане гендерный вопрос поднят на уровень государственной политики. В обществе формируется нетерпимое отношение ко всем формам дискриминации и насилия в отношении женщин.
Что касается молодежной политики, в парламентах созданы молодежные парламенты, которые активно участвуют в жизни парламента. Более того, формируется корпус молодежные послы цели устойчивого развития, деятельность которого направлена на пропаганду, продвижение национальных целей и задач среди молодежи. В целом, все задачи резолюции были отражены в дорожной карте, утвержденной совместным постановлением двух палат нашего парламента и взят под контроль. Считаем, что разработка подобных дорожных карт другими странами, исходя из национального контекста, способствовала бы более эффективной реализации мониторинга и оценки целей устойчивого развития. Уважаемые участники вебинара, дорогие коллеги, остается меньше семи лет для подведения итогов поставленных целей и задач в глобальной повестке дня. Действовавший с 2020 года режим чрезвычайной ситуации, связанной с COVID-19 в мире, ограничивала наши действия. Объявление Всемирной организации здравоохранения о завершении режима чрезвычайной ситуации COVID-19 в мире является для нас новой возможностью, чтобы объединить наши усилия и действия на улучшение благосостояния и защиту нашей планеты. Именно этому и призывает резолюция. Дамы и господа, в завершении своего выступления хотела бы заверить, что Узбекистан и далее будет укреплять тесное взаимодействие Межпарламентским союзом со всеми структурными подразделениями Организации Объединенных Наций, а также парламентами всех стран в целях обеспечения устойчивого развития и построения благополучного будущего. Благодарю вас за внимание. With many thanks uh, to Her Excellency, uh, the Chairwoman of the Senate from Uzbekistan, for her keynote address, uh, I'd like to now um, announce that we're going to move into the interactive debate. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge before doing this um, that uh, uh, we've had some issues with interpretation, it seems, and that we will be able to share um the uh the speech of her excellency miss tazila narbaeva uh, in writing with all the meeting participants we apologize for any uh technical issues or inconveniences this may have caused um uh, so i hope that the moderation team will advise if if the interpretation is working now because it is essential that we are able to operate in in th in three languages as foreseen um Okay, well, while we are waiting to hear from, from the team, I'd like to now uh, move us towards the thematic segment focused on SDG 7, affordable and clean energy. As we already mentioned, affordable and clean energy is a fundamental uh, part of the Agenda 2030. It is also an essential area of action for uh, for the world to be able to achieve the ambitious objective set in the Paris Agreement on, on combating uh, the effects of climate change. Uh, we believe that um, the focus on this topic will provide um, a much needed uh, boost to, to the role of, uh, of parliaments in addressing the issues on affordable and clean energy uh, in their respective countries. And we have an excellent panel of experts with us today um, to, uh, to share their perspectives on, on this topic. I'd like to briefly uh, introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, we have with us Mr. Dario Liguti, Director of Sustainable Energy Division from UNECE. We have Ms. Kimberly Rosemary, the Economic Affairs Officer from Energy Division, UNSCAP. And we have Ms. Maria Musmuti, Associate Research Fellow uh, in the Sir William Dale Center for Legislative Studies, Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in the University of London. Um, uh, please welcome warmly our, our speakers. Um, we hope this panel can be interactive uh, and we encourage you to post your questions in the chat. Hopefully we will also have sufficient time for a quick Q&A and a discussion after the presentation of of, uh, of the panelists so it can be more of a talk show and we can we can interact uh more than more than just look at presentations um uh, so please uh you know stay engaged 
I understand there will also be some online polls uh, launched during the discussions. Um, with this, uh, I'd like to, um, to ask our panelists uh, um, a first round of questions and I ask them to please, please try to be concrete, introduce the topics you'd like to speak about with examples. Uh, and, and then of course, be ready for the interaction with our distinguished audience, uh, with the honorable uh, members of parliament who are online today. Uh, I also understand that we uh, will have um, an intervention from Professor Akmal Saidov, um, uh, who is the first deputy speaker of the legislative chamber of the Oli Majlis of the Republic of Uzbekistan and the vice president of the executive committee of the IPU. Uh, uh, Mr. Saidov, I will invite you to speak um, right after the, the, the panel uh, finishes their presentations. So thank you very much for joining us and, and I'd like to recognize your presence and ask, uh, ask you to be ready to speak after the panel. Uh, so let me now turn uh, to, um, uh, to Dario Liguti, who is the Director of Sustainable Energy of UNICE and comes with a, a long career in, in the public and the private sector uh, with a focus on energy issues. Um, uh, Dario, could you tell us um, a bit about the progress on SDG 7 in the UNEC region? You could keep your initial round uh, um, uh, short so we can have more time for, for the second round as well. Over to you, Dario. Thank you, Dimitri. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, Your Excellencies, gentlemen and ladies. And thank you very much for uh, having me uh, address such a, an illustrious constituency in the stakeholder environment around energy. Um, I, will, I had a presentation ready, but you asked me to be very short, so I'll be very short. And in a nutshell, we have made some progress in the UNEC, uh, and, uh, and, uh, but that progress has been slowed down. And actually, is uh, let me give you, when it comes to the SDG 7, which is the SDG on energy, we have two main metrics which is uh, the uptake of, of renewable energy and the energy efficiency degrees. When it comes to uptake of energy of renewable energy, there has been progress since 2000, but that progress has slowed down over since 2018, unfortunately. Uh, the number of countries that actually were the share of renewable energy out of the 56 countries that co constitute our, our commission that have actually raised the, or overcome the barrier of 10% has actually increased to 44 countries. Uh, there are four countries which are actually above 50%. And uh, we still have one country uh, who is, is below 1%. Uh, so, and that has been an increasing. I mean, in 2000, there were 26, then it went to, to, to 40 in 2015, and in 2020, there were 44. So there is an increase in the uptake of, the, of that renewable energy improving, but that's certainly not, uh, uh, can you, can you just leave the, the initial slide, please? Uh, and, uh, but that is not to say, thank you, but that is not to say that uh, uh, that is actually, the, the path is going as fast as possible. We should have all of the countries above 50% and more if we were to achieve the 2030 uh, um, goals when it comes to renewable energy. That renewable energy, by the way, is for 89% constituted by hydropower, and the smaller, uh, smaller share on solar and wind, which are growing fast, but not fast enough, as I said. So that's point number one. The point number two is actually is on energy efficiency. Our region is a heavily industrial uh, region, uh, North America, Europe, Central Asia, the ex-Soviet uh, Union states, it's a heavily industrialized. And therefore, energy intensity has been and is uh, very high. It has come down since 2000 by 42% on average across the region, but still the energy intensity in our, which corresponds to the amount of energy that is actually used for the production of 1% of GDP, it's still above where it should be. In particular, in a number of countries uh, in Central Asia and the ex Soviet Union, that energy intensity is still, there is a lot of progress that can be made. Uh, and that is an important part because energy efficiency is the first fuel. I mean, if we were, if we are to achieve the 2030 global uh, global goals, energy efficiency has to be one of the main important, most important drivers around decreasing the consumption of energy. 
in, in, in industrial processes, in the built environment, and, uh, and across all the uh, utilizations of energy, including transport, of course, whether it is on road or shipping and aviation when it comes uh, to, that, uh, uh, to those considerations. So Dimitri, I would say it's encouraging, but not, not fast enough. We are not on the current path. We will not achieve the 2030 uh, objectives as it is. And so the, 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 the recommendations that we as a commission have been giving to our member states are fundamentally of, let's say, of a different nature, but they can be summarized. There are many, but they can be summarized around four different recommendations. The first one is, of course, our region has undergone recently uh, a, a set of crises, you know, coming from COVID-19, the aftermath of COVID-19 and therefore supply chain issues, for example, the war in Ukraine, and obviously uh, the climate change uh, impacts that are increasing and having a, a, an ever larger impact in the region, as, as well across the other regions around the world. So certainly, uh, I would say one of the things that uh, we learned throughout this is that the energy resilience which is constituted by energy affordability, energy security, and energy sustainability, it's crucial to have to uh, bring forward the 2030 agenda. We have, we cannot, and this, the role of parliaments is very important in here because these three dimensions, and we will speak about that uh, more in detail later, are in between, are interlinked between themselves and they constitute Decision. They constitute the criteria around what, which to take energy decisions in the in the energy policy making space. So certainly that is needs to be taken into into account. It means integrated planning, integrated thinking when it comes to the energy systems. The second aspect is behavioral barriers. It is important that we, all of us as consumers, as, as either as individual consumers or as workers in our, in our everyday life, we take into consideration that climate change is here and that we need to change as well our own, our own ways of consuming, producing, moving uh, around uh, doing the, and then to have a real impact on that one. The third one is investments. Uh, it is needed a, 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 a very important increase in the in, in flows, in financial flows, especially towards the focus countries, the program countries in our region, when it comes to the energy transition. The energy, the, our, the focus countries, 17 countries out of 56 are our program countries, only 2.2% of the world investment in energy uh, in energy transition has gone to that region. A lot more is needed to help those countries to in, in, undertake the energy transition at scale. So that's that's the third point. And the fourth point is is is, is certainly looking. But we will speak more about that later about the interlinkages and the nexuses between energy and water and land and food production and a number of other issues. So that you you can the, the linkage is really between the SDGs, not only SDG seven on its own, but SDG in, integrated within the overall family of the SDGs. Dimitri, this is for now, and back to you. Thank you, and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dario. Uh, this is a very clear picture, a mixed picture that uh, that uh, you painted for us for for the EC region. Now we have. Um, uh, the unique situation where uh, several countries in the world are covered uh, by both uh, the Regional Commission for Europe and the Regional Commission for the Asia and the Pacific. And it would be uh, then very interesting to compare notes across the two. But then I'm turning now to ESCAP. Kimberly, can you tell us the picture for the broader ESCAP region um, when it comes to SDG 7 uh, progress? If you could also be brief, so we leave more time for interaction, uh, and then we we'll hopefully can go for the second round after. Over to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here and a true honor. Um, if I could just please ask that my slides are put up on the screen. Those are the last presenter slides.
Let's go ahead, maybe, while the slides are being uploaded. Sure. OK, thank you so much. Um, if I might, uh, here we are. If we could just go to the next slide, please. Just briefly wanted to introduce SCAP. Um, we are the most inclusive intergovernmental platform for the Asia Pacific region. And it's a vast area that our commission uh, covers with 53 member states and nine associate members. Uh, the huge variety in terms of the size of the economies that we cover, as well as the development status of each of those uh, member states. And uh, as was mentioned, we are uh, one of the five regional commissions of the United Nations, and we do have some overlap with ECE. Uh, next slide, please. So quickly to touch base on uh, SDG 7, I think everyone here is pretty familiar with it, but um, in contrast to the last uh, presentation that you heard, uh, in the Asia Pacific region, we are also looking quite a bit at the first uh, target under SDG 7, and that's around universal access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy services. And I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about that particular target and its indicators on electrification uh, and clean cooking. Uh, but we also, of course, are looking at the share of the renewable energy mix and uh, energy efficiency in terms of energy intensity. Uh, next slide, please. So as we've heard, uh, access to electricity is an area where we've seen a lot of excellent progress. Um, we see, and I'm sorry if this is too small for you, but hopefully you can see that um, we have really um, experienced an increase in the share from 2000 to 2021. And in the past, we had a huge difference between urban and rural areas in terms of their electrification. Uh, but that gap has really closed quite significantly in the recent period. And now we are approaching uh, universal access across the region, of course, with some of the remote uh, and hard to reach communities uh, and rural areas making up that, that remaining bulk of that remaining share. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, the picture is not um, as positive when we talk about uh, clean cooking and access to uh, those clean fuels and technologies, which uh, we are defining as primarily LPG and electric cooking. Um, and you can see that the rates are much lower. And in terms of policy focus, clean cooking is probably one of the, is arguably the most overlooked aspect of the SDG 7 agenda, and we are certainly not on track to achieve this. Next slide, please. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about SDG 7 and the targets and how um, just the target itself and the indicators are not enough. So when we talk about electrification, the positive uh, story is that we're achieving or approaching universal access. Um, but we also need to look at um, measuring not just whether or not a household has a connection, but we need to think about access in terms of tiers of access. And so when at, at the lowest tiers of access, this is less than three watts of capacity uh, and very little uh, hours of supply, we might have a household that's able to, to utilize a light bulb or two. Um, at the top tier, the full range of household appliances becomes available. So at tier one, perhaps, a household has a, 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 a connection in the same for tier five and those under the SDG target are counted as uh, the same, but really there's much more nuanced story that needs to be um, pursued here because achieving the top tiers of access really must be the target that we're going for because that's where the social and economic benefits can be realized. And this is really important for two key reasons. First, we're seeing the broad scale electrification of end uses. So particularly for heating, cooling, cooking, large energy consuming uh, appliances that require high capacity, 24 hour reliable and affordable. Affordability is also very important. Affordable electricity. 
Secondly is the uh, resilience of populations in the face of climate change. So in the Asia Pacific region, we're seeing heat waves that are increasingly more frequent and extreme. Overall temperatures are on the rise and populations are increasingly exposed to health risks from heat. And air conditioning, which was once considered a luxury, is increasingly becoming a necessity in, in these times. And so if you do not have um, high capacity, reliable uh, electricity service, then those populations remain at risk. But at the same time, as these appliances come online, our power grids are exposed to higher levels of stress, higher peak demand. And so these considerations must be integrated together in terms of population and their resilience, uh, power planning and, and grid, uh, grid construction. Um, however, I will, we'll note that one of the key challenges we face is that this end use data is really scarce. Um, and that really is a key barrier for better planning and evidence-based decision-making. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna to touch uh, briefly, um, but on, in terms of renewable energy, of course, you know, Asia Pacific is a key player in the global picture, but despite the rapid uptakes of renewables, the share in the final energy mix still is lagging behind the global rate due to the parallel uptake of fossil fuels. And in terms of energy efficiency, Asia and the Pacific uses more energy per unit of GDP produced than the global average in many um, other regions around the world. And so therefore, much more needs to be accomplished on both of these fronts, particularly for energy efficiency, which as you know, is the lowest cost means of meeting energy demand. And we need to see more efforts across sectors in, in energy efficiency. And one of the great benefits of Asia Pacific and its rapidly development developing nature is that there is the opportunity to leapfrog technologies and approaches. New cities are being built. And so even in terms of, say, urban planning, there's the potential to uh, utilize urban planning to lower energy consumption of cities somewhere between 25 and 50 percent for heating, cooling, and transport through urban planning. But this requires a, a very systems approach to how we think about energy and its use. Next slide. Uh, Kimberly, if I can ask you to start wrapping up, please. Sure. Well, then I'll have five, five key recommendations. I'll go through them quickly. Uh, number one, next slide, please. Learn from others. So in, in Asia Pacific, we had a ministerial declaration that requested the secretariat to provide more data and policy information. So we have the Asia Pacific Energy Portal, where you can learn from other countries what they're doing in, across the sustainable energy agenda. Next, please. Second is deepen the knowledge base at the national level. More data is needed. Unfortunately, their, their lack of data, despite the presence of really great analytical tools, uh, doesn't allow for the use of those tools to the maximum potential to inform evidence-based decision-making. Next, please. This is just a quick uh, look at the next step methodology, which SCAP has produced. But if you see on the right, the key input is data. So again, going back to the importance of data at the, at the end use level. Next. And this is a leap modeling. Next. My number three recommendation is quantify the cost of inaction. Um, we, we have some rough numbers globally, maybe even regionally, but at the national level, what are the costs if we don't move forward with the clean energy transition? Next, please. Fourth, think in systems and its co-benefits. We can't think of just in the energy sector. We must think of the, the, the benefits across the economy, to social and environmental benefits of our actions. And fifth, Next slide is enable innovation. So I just wanted to give this example here of virtual Singapore, where they've actually created a 3D empowered smart uh, model of, of the um, city itself. And this allows for a no risk testing platform for both policies uh, and, and uh, planning. And so this is taking advantage of the power of AI, virtual extended reality in order to support our decision-making. That's it for my side. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Kimberly. Uh, now, uh, having heard from uh, the two regional commissions on the snapshot of the SDG 7 progress in, in, in the um, ECE and SCAP regions, we turn to a view um, from, from an expert who can especially highlight uh, what is the legislative agenda around these challenges and what can parliaments do. I'm very pleased to pass the floor to Maria Musmuti, who, as I mentioned, is a lecturer at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at the University of London. Um, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dmitri. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure, but an honor to be here with, uh, with such a distinguished audience. So I think to respond to your question, I think there are three key things that parliaments can actually uh, do. I mean, obviously much more than three, but I would like to group them in three um, uh, pillars. And the first one is to have a dedicated body that can actually um, look and monitor and follow up on the issues. And I know this might sound common sense and very obvious, but it's impossible to do that if the issues are fragmented here and there and you need to sort of coordinate or if nobody has it in its mandate. So it's important to have a body that has this mandate explicitly. And what is interesting is to see examples around the world, parliaments around the world that are creating such bodies caucuses or committees that uh, cut across political divides, that have these thematic mandates related either to the SDGs or energy or climate change or more than one of these issues, and um, are which are responsible to follow up on them. And I think this is a, a very important uh, a starting point. The second thing that uh, parliaments can do and can uh, do even more than what they are doing on this now is to use the SDGs as a lens for scrutiny. So mainstream the SDGs in all aspects of the work. And I'm referring particularly to their legislative work and their oversight work. And I mean, this might sound obvious again, but the practicalities of it, what we see is that we don't see as much of it as we would have liked. There are positive examples and there are committees, I'm thinking of a committee in Ecuador that has actually put up a, a checklist for checking new legislation to make sure that it is aligned with uh, uh, the SDGs and specific SDGs, for example, SDG 7. So this kind of specific work where laws that are coming in, the parliament is scrutinizing whether they are compliant with the SDGs, whether they are aligned with what we are trying to achieve. I think it is very important. And on the other side of the legislative cycle, um, uh, looking at the laws that are already there to see whether they're really delivering, whether to see whether what they are delivering is aligned with the SDGs and what we are trying to achieve and see what kind of change might be necessary there. I think this is extremely uh, uh, important. And the third point, and um, uh, Dario mentioned uh, something uh, uh, around that uh, before, is that Many of the SDGs and particularly SDG seven have many behavioral aspects. So it's not just for the government to do work. It's the, where is there for all of us to do. We all need to change our beha behaviors and patterns, businesses, citizens, everyone. So I think this is another very important part uh, uh, that parliaments can play in raising awareness, reaching out and engaging in a dialogue with, with citizens with regard to, to, to push them to actually change their behaviors on the one hand, but also to investigate whether that is working or whether there are better ways to uh, do that. So I think I will stop here. As I said, there are quite a few interesting examples from around the world. So Parliaments are taking action uh, in relation to SDG 7 and the SDGs in general, but I think there's so much more to we can we can uh, expect in these um, three areas of um, creating seeing dedicated bodies that focus uh, on that. Uh, using the SDGs as a lens for scrutiny and also reaching out and entering in a dialogue with with uh, all stakeholders with regard to the best way to do that back to you. Dimitri. 
Thank you very much, Maria. You highlighted a number of important points and we'll come back to them in, in the second part of our discussion. But right now, I'd like us to pause and ask you, uh, honorable members of parliament and other participants, to please respond to um, a short uh, poll, uh, online uh, poll. So I'm asking uh, the moderation team to please um, present the Zoom poll um, on screen. Uh, are you happy with the progress of SDG implementation in your country? Uh, please um, take, take a minute or so to respond uh, very quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we are, we are having a very quick set of uh, answers here. In the meantime, uh, I'd like to now recognize that uh, Uzbekistan and Brunei have asked uh, for, uh, for the floor. I'd like to now pass the floor for the quick remarks to uh, Professor Ak Akmal Said, the first deputy speaker of the Legislative Chamber of the Oil Majlis of Republic of Uzbekistan. Uh, Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, Dimitri, thank you so much. And I uh, today is, uh, won't speak, uh, but not vice president of IPU, but I'm a first uh, uh, vice speaker of Uzbek parliament. It's very interesting uh, speakers. I fully agree with uh, three of our speakers. And I would indicate the six directions of the realization SDG uh, in the world. The first direction is the legislative basis. Each speaker noted about this. The second, we must have institutional basis of realization SDG, institutional, including parliamentary commission of realization SDG, for example, in Uzbekistan and so on. The second, educational base, it's more important. We must uh, propagate all of the uh, SDGs in each country. The fourth, this uh, monitoring system. I fully agree with, uh, with last hour speaker, uh, Maria, when, he, when she said about the necessity of uh, establishment of the group as, as more important. And fifth, uh, this uh, direction, this uh, participation, civil society institutions in the realization of SDG is the more important, but not only uh, representative of executive uh, branch of power, uh, parliamentarians and the judicial and so on, more important for realization of SDG. This is a, this is a, you know, uh, participation of the civil society. Against. And last, the sixth direction, this is international uh, cooperation. Uh, this our uh, webinar also one of the indicators our international cooperation. The aim of international cooperation is the uh, changing informations, learn experience, and so on. And we must maybe in, uh, adopted some concrete recommendations. Uh, for example, uh, the Dario said no, 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 no. Kimberly said five recommendations uh, regarding the uh, implementation. So it's more important. Um, and I want that it's very, this uh, common, common my open opinions about the realization of, and I, I want to stress it. This resolution of the General Assembly of Iran was adopted by the initiative of the President of the Republic of Uzbekistan, Mr. Mirziyoyev. When he, uh, during the, his speech in 75th uh, Sesh General Assembly, he said about necessity of adoption, adoption, the special resolution on enhancing the role of national parliaments in, in, in the relation SDG, the more important. And I have a few words about the concrete, concrete steps, uh, steps further SDG 7. Uh, I want to uh, indicate five examples of how the Uzbekistan parliament is working towards achieving SDG 7. First, legislative support of renewable energy. Second, creating awareness and advocacy. Third, parliamentary oversight. Fifth, uh, fourth, promoting uh, interlinks with the SDGs. And uh, last, fifth, Par partnership for uh, implementation. This is uh, the uh, main, main directions of, thank you so much.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice Speaker, uh, for a very clear and very illustrative um, way of presenting what a parliament can do to promote the SDGs generally and SDG 7 in particular. We take good note. Um, I'd like to now um, give the floor uh, to the honorable representatives of um, the uh, parliament of Brunei Darussalam. Thank you. Good afternoon, honorable delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lao Hao Teng, member of the Legislative Council of Brunei Darussalam. I'm accompanied by honorable Dr. Haji Mahali, Haji Momin, and honorable Muhammad Ali Tanjong, members of the Legislative Council of Brunei Darussalam. We look forward to sessions lined up to participate in this discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chairman, Chairperson. Enhancing the role of parliaments in accelerating the achievement of Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, is a paramount objective in pursuit of global sustainability in Brunei Darussalam. Efforts are underway to strengthen engagement between members of parliament of the SDG Secretariat of Brunei Darussalam, which is under the purview of Prime Minister Office Currently, the SDG Secretariat is actively working on establishment a close network with the Legislative Council, recognizing the importance of Council's involvement in driving sustainability development agendas by fostering a collaborative relationship. It is anticipated that the Legislative Council will have an increased opportunity to contribute to the implementation of SDGs and further align legislative actions with the global sustainability agenda. In assessing progress towards SDG 7, Brunei has made remarkable strides. Brunei's commitment to promoting universal access to electricity is evident in the achievement of indicator 7.1.1 with the population's access to electricity reaching 100% in 2021. Similarly, Brunei has excelled in indicator 7.1.2 as the population's primary reliance on clean fuels and technologies also reached 100% in 2021. The net worthy progress extends to indicator 7.2.1, which tracks the renewable energy share in the total final energy consumption. Brunei experienced a notable increase in this indicator. If the share renewable energy rise from 0.03% in 2020 to 0.12% in 2021, indicating the country's commitment to diversifying the, its energy mixed with integrating renewable energy resources. Brunei recognizes the need to strike a balance between economic growth, social development, and environmental protection that forms the very foundation of sustainable development. Brunei intended national determined contributions in the energy sector is to reduce total energy consumption by 63% in 2035, compared to the business as usual scenario, and to increase the share renewables so that 10% of the total power generations in source from renewable energy by 2035. Towards this, measures have been taken to reduce fossil fuel demand for inland energy use through a revised power tariff that encourages energy savings. Land transport sector is to reduce carbon dioxide emission from morning peak hour vehicle use by 40% by 2035. Forestry sector is to increase the total gazette forest reserves to 55% of total land area compared to the current levels of 41%. The government also further aspires to generate at least 10% of the total power from new and renewable resources by 2035. According to the University of Oxford's 
our world data platform. Brunei Darussalam is the second lowest polluted country in the world with the particulate matter 2.5 means uh, annual exposure and just 5.9 micrograms per cubic meter. The annual average concentrations of which was stated by WHO should not exceed five grams per cubic meter. Combating climate change also opens an, a possibility economic and entrepreneurs opportunities for Brunei, which is, it is possible that some innovative entrepreneurs will come up with solutions for climate change and offer spin-off industries in Brunei. Energy and Industry Department at the Prime Minister's Office as the national focal point for climate change under the Paris Agreement. We'll continue to engage with relevant stakeholders in setting realistic targets that take into account our future industry scenario, including our national emissions intensity reduction target. This is part of the preparation for the national determined contribution document, which will be legally binding document under the Paris Agreement once it enters into force. The agreement will enter into force 30 days after at least 55 countries, accounting of the, for at least 55% of the global greenhouse gas emissions ratify the Paris Agreement. At present, 60 out of 197 countries, accounting of 47.62% of global greenhouse gas emission have ratified the Paris Agreement. During the opening ceremony of a new session of the Legislative Council, His Majesty the Sultan of Brunei Darussalam has announced the importance on the implementation of a climate change laboratory center. The state budget through the second Minister of Finance and Economy has said about 700,000 from the government's for the year 2023 to 24 budget will be set aside for phase one of the center from a planning cost of 2.1 million. This center will serve as a think tank knowledge hub strategic coordinator and integrator for of climate actions, initiatives, and activities in the ASEAN region. Leading to this as a way forward, Brunei is on track to meet the climate pledge. Brunei is on track to reduce greenhouse emission by 20% by year 2030, in line with the commitments of the Paris Agreement. It has pledged to reach net zero emission by 2050. For further advanced SDG 7, Brunei recognizes the importance of seeking technical assistance. Consequently, Brunei is active seeking support from the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for the Asia and the Pacific UNICEF to formulate a comprehensive SDG 7 roadmap tailored to the country specific context. This roadmap will provide a strategic framework for Brunei to effectively address challenges, capitalize and on opportunities and outline clear pathway towards achievement the target set forth in the SD7. By leveraging the expertise and guidance provided by UNESCO, Brunei aims to enhance its capacity and accelerate progress in the energy sector, aligning its efforts with the global sustainability goals. The Legislative Council also expresses an unwavering support for Brunei steadfast commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals and the commendable alignment with the national vision of Wawasan Brunei 2035. The second voluntary donation review, VNR, underscores significant advancements achieved through the integration of the SDGs, enhanced institutional arrangement, and the implementation evidence based on monitoring and reporting mechanism. Brunei Darussalam has made remarkable strides in pivotal private sector, encompassing healthcare, economic diversification, education, 
social protection, and environmental sustainability. Through the recent initiatives, an active participant in the global sustainability agenda, Brunei has launched the SDGs website, coupled with the upcoming presentation of its second voluntary new renewal, national renewal, VNR, at the United Nations level political forum in July. Highlights Brunei dedication to the sustainable development, the SDG website serves as a valuable platform to promoting awareness of Brunei national efforts and providing updates on the sustainable development progress. Through knowledge sharing and data visualization generated by the national SDG tracker, the website enhanced public understanding and engagement in the SDG. Additionally, the upcoming VNR report a comprehensive assessment of progress since the last review in 2020 demonstrate Brunei commitment in evaluating the impact, analyzing interlinkages across the SDG. Sir, with, with my apologies, I would like to ask you to please start wrapping up as we need to move on with the debate. Okay. In conclusion, Brunei Darussalam has demonstrated its long commitment to sustainable development and the achievement of the sustainable development goals. The efforts to strengthen engagement between members of parliament and the SDG secretary, as well as remarkable progress in areas such as universal access to electricity, renewable energy integration, climate change policy, the emission of reductions targets, showcase Brunei's dedication to global sustainability. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Chairman. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, sorry, apologies to have to uh, to interrupt you. And we really, really appreciate you sharing the impressive journey uh, that Brunei Darussalam is taking and the role of the Legislative Council in it in advancing the Paris Agreement goals in the country, as well as um, uh, in specifically tackling the sustainable energy challenges. We've heard two very interesting interventions from uh, Uzbekistan and Brunei that illustrate the kinds of challenges that um, uh, member states and their legislatures are, are facing. I'd like to now ask the team to please project the results of the poll so that uh, we can all see it. Um, hope you can all see it. Uh, as you see, it's a mixed, uh, mixed picture. Uh, there is, uh, well, a great degree of uncertainty um, and and then, well, there is some reassurance that that in some countries the progress on SDGs uh, is uh, uh, is uh, assessed as, as positive. Yet we know that globally, as well as in both regions, unfortunately, we are behind on most of the SDG targets. And at this rate, um, uh, the uh, SDGs are not achievable in most countries of the world by 2030. Uh, with this in mind, and, and having heard the snapshot on SDG 7 in, in both SCAP and EC region, I'd like now to turn to uh, our panelists and uh, dear, um, dear colleagues, distinguished members of parliament, you will have a chance to ask more questions and interact just after this. Um, I'd like to turn now to our panelists, to um, Maria, uh, Kimberly and Dario, um, asking them, asking them, to first of all, uh, well, uh, present in a bit more detail with some examples, what can and should be done um, at the level of parliaments to advance the agenda uh, of the SDG 7. Um, we also know that uh, in, in both SCAP and ECE uh, have been working on the roadmaps for SDG 7 achievement. You have also presented some, some uh, policy recommendations. So if you could, in the next, the second round, reflect on the role of parliament and what can we do to support parliaments to have clear evidence base for legislative action, for oversight, for some of the other important functions that parliaments play uh, when it comes to um, SDG uh, agenda generally, but specifically, specifically um, uh, SDG seven. I, I would like to remind us all that the uh, paragraph five of the General Assembly resolution that we are discussing here today encourages parliaments to ensure 
um, that their oversight mechanisms are well structured and have appropriate resources and equipment, as well as access to expertise and resources to ensure qualified monitoring and evaluation of national development plans and strategies for achievement of the 2030 agenda. So, is this happening in the in SDG 7? Are parliaments ready for this? So, I'd like to hear from the experts, and then we'll turn to the distinguished uh, parliamentarians. Uh, let me start this time, Kimberly, with you, please. Uh, so a few examples, focus on the role of parliaments and, and maybe a few words about the roadmap. And if you could kindly keep your intervention to you know three, five minutes, so we can keep some time for discussion. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. So um, as was touched upon um, by others, we are working on these SDG 7 roadmaps. And uh, as I said in my uh, previous intervention, the role of data is just so invaluable. And what we find is that lack of data really hinders some of the uh, analysis that can be performed under these roadmap interventions. So um, first thing I, I would suggest is that there really needs to be a focus on ensuring that uh, countries have good quality, reliable data and that there's budget and expertise uh, put toward uh, those efforts in the energy sector, particularly around end use. Um, the SDG 7 roadmaps are a product of um, an analytical model, and so um, ensuring that the foundation of that analysis and that modeling effort is strong is, is really, really critical. But out of those roadmaps, we also have um, an excellent set of key recommendations that, that emerge from that analysis. And so looking to identify uh, what are the low hanging fruits and where can, where can the country invest in the most meaningful actions out of those key recommendations across the SDG 7 uh, targets of energy access, efficiency, uh, and renewables. Um, and I would also encourage that we look beyond just SDG 7 as our, our uh, indicators of success and, and ensure that we're delving deeper into um, what it means to have uh, access to energy that's going to promote social and economic development. We really need um, systems approach cross-ministerial, cross-sectoral engagement and collaboration is really required because no, no issue really can just be limited to, to one sector. There, is, there are benefits and costs that are realized across sectors. And so encouraging that cross-sectoral, cross-ministerial, as well as that systems thinking around energy is, is really important. Um, and lastly, uh, as I on my last slide, I really would encourage innovation uh, and harnessing the tools of today that are emerging with AI, uh, VR, and other um, new sources of data that that are emerging and that can really inform um, our policy making efforts. That's it from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kimberly, and and we'll we'll come back to that. Uh... Uh, last point as well. Dario, over to you for an insight from EC region when it comes to what do the parliaments need to know and how can we strengthen the evidence base? Right. Can I can I ask please to, to load the slides because I have two concrete examples of what, uh, what have we been, been engaging uh, with parliaments. But before while the slides have been uh, uh, loaded, I, I would like to stress the point that Kimberly made. I think parliaments have a very important role in playing in looking at the different trade-offs. Any decision in the energy space, as Kimberly said, but as I said before in my previous uh, talk, it has impacts across the whole society, including food, including water, including you know how uh, income distribution, a number of issues where actually uh, they're not technocratic decisions. These are fundamentally political decisions that need to be taken in a democratic setup. And therefore, parliaments play a very important role in doing that. And one of the most important things that we've been trying is to give parliaments the ability to understand what those consequences are, what the trade-offs are, 
what the information, underlying information that Kimberly mentioned as well, is necessary to take those decisions in an accurate and transparent way. And be bearing in mind all the different aspects around these uh, policy making decisions. Um, I see that the slides are not loaded, but let me let me continue in the interest of time. Here we are. Next slide, please. Let me just two very quick examples. The first one is we've been uh, across a number of countries in our region doing what we call the hard talks. We call them hard because we actually put everything on the table and we actually say what's not working. That's the reason why we call it hard talks. And we put around the table all the stakeholders in what it takes to take to increase the deployment of renewable energy. And what are the consequences? What are the impact of increasing that deployment on water, on agriculture, on the environment, on land use, on all of these issues? And parliaments are part of these hard talks. They participate alongside the other stakeholders, which Kimberly mentioned, some of the ministries, of course, the local administrations, the population, private sector, of course, providers of technologies, providers of financial means, but certainly parliaments need to, and, and they do participate in our hard talks. As we say, next, next slide, please. Here, and, and I'm making uh, mention as well to the nexuses that, I, that we discussed about before, and that Kimberly as well said, how a, a decision in the energy space can affect other spaces. And only parliaments, I believe, win in a transparent and a political, you know, in a democratic way, can decide what those, those, uh, those, those consequences should be and how they should be distributed across, across the, different, uh, the different segments. Next, next uh, slide, please. And the second one, as I mentioned before, is about building resilient energy systems. Here is the, is the trilemma, they call it, in the energy space. is between how you find an equilibrium between energy sustainability, energy affordability, and energy security. We have seen over the last few years that equilibrium has been, uh, the last few months, excuse me, that equilibrium being extremely uh, impacted by a number of crises that I mentioned before. And here is where Rob Hallemans, in our view, play a major role. And we're working, we will, we're working on a, next, next slide, please. We're working on a, on a set of tools to be able for to in parliaments to take informed decisions on where, on how to build uh, energy, uh, resilient energy, uh, energy system. This one is the first publication that is sums up the work of our uh, commission around the space and how the parliaments, but not only of course parliaments, but they should be looking at when look, taking the decisions in the energy space. We then followed up, next slide please, with a number of, of sectoral and more, uh, a more, a more, sorry, next slide again. Here we are with a number of dedicated, uh, uh, dedicated uh, uh, in-depth analysis on the different aspects of our the uh, energy resilience systems to support the 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 the, the decision making at parliaments. I think the poll was very clear. I mean, a thirty, I believe, thirty nine percent of the of the uh, of the of the poll say they weren't sure about where they were with the SDGs. Well, this is part of. The information campaign that we're, that we're doing, we're supporting by supporting, providing data, providing with the caveat that Kimberly mentioned, of course, because as well in our region, we suffer from not, uh, you know, an extremely good quality of data, but with providing data, providing methodologies to, for the decision making and providing in-depth analysis and knowledge around some of those decisions, because this is possible. If we go to the slide before, is, is actually, this is the tool that we have elaborated for all stakeholders, for all decision making, uh, uh, the previous slide, please. For all the different, uh, uh, this, thank you, the, the different uh, um, decision makers around and parliaments, of course, is the carbon neutrality toolkit. This is a decision making tool that helps the, count, the countries to drive or to draw their path towards carbon neutrality according to the, the objectives that they have set out in their NDCs and in the achievement of the Agenda 2030. So the first one we already engaged, 
This one is to support parliaments and it's, it's, it's out there, it's available. We're happy to engage as well with, with, with parliaments. We have been engaging with the application of carbon neutrality in certain countries across the, across the region to help them uh, design that path towards carbon neutrality, to, which includes as well, as I mentioned, energy efficiency, renewable energy, et cetera. But certainly, I, we believe that parliaments have the role, the role of the parliaments that need to play is to take informed decisions around the different trade-offs in the region and, and you know, be very open and transparent about that and very knowledgeable about that. And back to you, Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dario, and, and also thank you for mentioning some very practical tools that the parliaments can use, and I hope the QR code was scannable, but between UNIC and UNESCOP, there is a, a variety of specific documents, tools that provide uh, useful information, and we hope that um, the distinguished members of parliament here today um, can good, make good use of it. Maria, uh, now turning to you, can you give us a critical look on this issue? And, and, and tell us what in your view are some of the, the biggest challenges also in addition to opportunities when it comes to the evidence base that the parliaments need to meaningfully um, get engaged in monitoring, but also in shaping this agenda going forward. We heard a lot about incentives. We heard a lot about uh, promoting uh, you know, smart policies, investment. So what's your critical look at it? You know, if you can help us bring it all together and, and also uh, specifically on data, if you can help us understand what do you think are, well, probably the biggest data gaps, but also uh, strategies uh, to, to adjust data availability. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. I will try to look at it from the perspective of parliaments, actually. And I think uh, I have a friend who works for a parliament and she says that parliament, that Parliamentary committees and parliamentarians are actually the kitchen of the parliament. It's where everything happens. It's where all the debates, all the discussions are taking place, where all of these different uh, things are coming together. And I think this is this is this is a good place to start. So I think what parliaments initially need is a good method, but a practical method about how to use the SDGs, SDG 7 or other SDGs as a lens for scrutiny. So the concrete steps, it, it, raising, I cannot stress how important it is to raise the, the, the correct questions. If you don't have the question, you will never come up with an answer. And data comes in order to help you formulate an answer. Evidence comes in order to help you formulate the answer. So raising the right questions is, I think, a very important point. And on this, on toolkits and methodologies and how to use the SDGs as a lens for scrutiny, um, I think IPU is also working to provide practical uh, uh, toolkits to assist in this, but also pilot projects and, you know, uh, concrete examples and case studies where this is applied, I think can be invaluable in um, uh, showing that it can be done, that it can be well done, and that it can, all, what, uh, uh, it can also prove the added value of this kind of work. When it comes to evidence and data, I mean, traditionally, parliaments have less resources compared to governments. So what I would say is that when it comes to evidence and data, there needs to be a smart use of the resources that parliaments have. And parliaments are representing people. So I think that they are very well placed to investigate not necessarily the most uh, obvious uh, aspects which others can do, but aspects which might be hidden, aspects which might not be uh, visible to everyone, or aspects that might not have been taken into account uh, so far. And I think this is important. So to, to um, collect statistical data might be almost impossible for parliament, but you can use data that is already there. There's no need to re-duplicate efforts, right? But what you can do is launch uh, a cause for evidence or investigate aspects which might be hidden and which might be related to what Dario also mentioned, impacts on different population groups that might not be heard, that might, might not be sufficiently represented. And that is a complementary but very, very, very valuable contribution to this uh, effort, I would say. And in relation to that, I think 
engaging with all stakeholders, but particularly with, with citizens and different groups of citizens is an important new way of collecting evidence and data. And I have some examples from France or Ireland, for example, where they put together, they convened citizens assemblies, uh, citizens uh, representing the country in its diversity and, and, and geographical and all other aspects. And discussing with experts and formulating recommendations and, and proposals that were then taken to parliament and were considered. And many of them actually formed uh, the basis for initiatives, whether legislative initiatives or policy initiatives or uh, monitoring and follow-up. And I think this important contribution of parliaments in reaching out, collecting evidence that is not available and using its resources smartly um, in the sense and using it and, and collecting data and evidence that others cannot connect, collect so, uh, uh, so well, I think can make a lot of difference because it can really um, give a more holistic understanding of the challenges that are related uh, to this. And it can also highlight the importance of the role of parliaments and the complementarity between institutions, because I think that's the key issue. Nobody can do this on their own. So we have to work together. So if we all do the part that we can do best, I think this can work better for, for everyone and can bring a a better uh, results. So I will stop here and happy to come back to if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Maria. Some very specific ideas on, on how parliaments could, could engage, be it through citizen assemblies or special um, you know, investigations or special panels to be, to be launched. And then we, we will try to bring this all together. But now, uh, distinguished members of parliament with about 10, 15 minutes left in, in our event. I'd like to first and foremost open the floor for your questions and, uh, uh, and interventions. I can see a hand from uh, Thailand. Sir, you have the floor, please. If you can uh, also introduce yourself. A greeting from Thailand. Thank you very much, moderator. I really learned a lot. This webinar is very inspiring and useful and practical. Of course, the, the first part is the uh, overview, big, big picture. But the second part uh, give us insights also how to. So a comment from Dario, uh, Kimberly, and Mary are very useful that we have to raise awareness and also with the uh, data and then look at various uh, part of the situation for inclusiveness uh, plan and future. Uh, I briefly would like to share that uh, we are trying to do. Uh, we try to set up the platform at the parliament uh, to oversize uh, the performance of uh, the government, particularly on SDG, and also focus on SDG number seven energy. And also, as uh, Kimberly know, we emphasize uh, the government emphasize on BCG by all circular green economy. With regard to circular economy, uh, it has been emphasized a lot of, of energy utilization by using uh, waste, waste product from animal, from uh, plant, whatever, uh, for fertilizer and also for fuel. And then green economy is a big picture. Look at everything. By all, uh, uh, we related to uh, by all economy in particular, agriculture and food system. So, so that is one key point. We try to monitor that. And uh, with regard to uh, uh, legislation, we also try to, uh, well, we are waiting now to have a, a act on climate, uh, climate change act that will involve various sectors, particularly pri uh, private sector, that they have to have data. Uh, to report back to the system. And uh, we also uh, try to uh, encourage uh, uh, renewable energy uh, production more and more by oversize the function. And uh, of course, uh, when we come up to the final report of BNR, we have mechanism uh, in the Senate that uh, whoever prepared the report, which is the Ministry of uh, foreign affair, they have to have uh, working with multi-stakeholder to get data. 
and information, including the uh, parliament. So the draft report will be scrutinized by all stakeholders. So in short, I think this is a very effective session. And the way we try to uh, approach in, 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 uh, and promote is a three uh, multi approach. The first one is multi stakeholder approach that uh, 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 Maria has emphasized many times. The second multi strategic approach that we emphasize uh, also database, but it will take time. Uh, of course, I, I, I may agree. And then the third approach is a multi level approach. Now we are talking about global and regional. And uh, also, we would like to have a national and then a local uh, at the community and people. Uh, whatever the uh, social economic activity, we have to have a SDG objective and particularly uh, SDG 7. With this uh, comment, we also try to promote a great deal of so called community forestry. In Thailand, we have 15,000 community forest that we would like them to take care of those forests. And then uh, eventually we will build, build up a, a carbon credit. And also we encourage them to have economy under the forest. Of course, we have a law that people can, uh, can earn living under the forest, but they cannot sell the, the land because the land still belongs to the, the state. Mm -hmm. So with this, I would like to thank you again for this uh, excellent session. Uh, and I also promote sharing and learning from each other that uh, Kimberly mentioned, learn, learn from other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your very insightful intervention and for sharing Thailand's experience too. Um, I understand we have a request for a short remark from Mr. Ali Hanuf from Uzbekistan. Я кратко скажу, что действительно мы полностью согласны с теми постулатами, с теми императивами, которые высказаны были нашими коллегами и полностью поддерживаем. Действительно, целью в области устойчивого развития является своеобразным призывом к действию, исходящим от всех стран, бедных они будут богатыми или среднеразвитыми. В этом контексте парламент играет активную роль в формировании законотворчества, мониторинга и продвижения повестки дня и цели в области устойчивого развития на период до 2030 года. Особо, особо важно было сказано активное участие и вовлечение членов парламента на национальном и региональном уровнях в поддержку достижения целей устойчивого развития. В нашей стране полностью создана правовая законодательная база по обеспечению возобновляемых источников энергии, по внедрению возобновляемых источников энергии, по климату, по адаптации и предотвращению изменений климата. В этом контексте я хочу просто информировать наших коллег практическую сторону этого вопроса. Академик господин Саидов полностью изложил нашу точку зрения, и поэтому действительно первое, что в прошлом году Узбекистан присоединился к инициативе глобального обязательства по сокращению метановых выбросов. Мы намерены снизить метановые выбросы на 30% до 2030 года и внести свой вклад в предотвращение изменения климата. Больше скажу, до 2030 года доля возобновляемых источников энергии должна достигнуть не менее 20 25% от общей энергосистемы. И за счет возобновляемых источников энергии будут пущены общая мощность энергетических мощностей общей мощностью 25 тысяч мегаватт. Это конкретно. Более того, наш парламент, наши парламентарии, в том числе наш Сенат, подготовил определение теории интенсивности изменений климата с предлагаемой формулой, где можно использовать для любой региона, как интенсивно меняется климат. 
В этом отношении мы готовы сотрудничать с нашими уважаемыми коллегами и поделиться также своим опытом. В целом я хочу поддержать и за интересную организацию такого вебинара. И мы надеемся, что в последующем мы дальше будем работать вместе, потому что это наше общее дело, это наша общая проблема. И не только во благо будущего поколения, я думаю, и нынешнее поколение ставит перед собой грандиозные задачи, которые можно решать сообща и вместе. Спасибо. Большое спасибо. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, we've heard now another very interesting intervention from Uzbekistan with, with some concrete ideas. And, and, and generally, I take away, uh, there is a wide variety of experiences in parliaments that we will do well by learning from uh, and ensuring that there is an ongoing uh, interaction between the parliamentarians from around the world uh, on how they can take an active, I would even say proactive part in, in shaping the SDG implementation agendas in their countries. How can they be at the center of monitoring and oversight? And then how can they be a driver of a multi-stakeholder inclusive approach uh, when it comes to making choices. This is about making choices on investment, on policies, on creating incentives for certain behaviors. Behavior change was emphasized a number of times. On creating links between science and policy making. We heard a number of interesting initiatives today about the role of the scientific community uh, when it comes to uh, the te technology interplay and the unique pathways that each ha country has uh, on achieving carbon neutrality, including uh, from the point of view of energy, um, but also now uh, in the modern times when it comes to ensuring data availability um, um, using modern means, including artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, big data, and so on. This was mentioned, and, and uh, by the way, I'd like to now use this opportunity to ask the technical moderation team to um, put up the second poll uh, regarding um, data availability. So while you are answering this, uh, the second poll, uh, do you easily have access to information or data regarding the progress of SDG implementation in your country? I'd like to start wrapping us up. Um, we, we have had an excellent uh, overview from um, SCAP, ECE, and, and from, uh, from uh, Ms. Musmuti. I'd like to give our panelists a chance for one line, one line, no slides, just very, very brief uh, takeaway uh, from this discussion, literally one line, and then we will be closing the event. Uh, Maria, this time I'd like to start with you. Thank you. Um... I think my one line is that parliaments can actually make a difference, can make a big difference. And in order to do that, they need to um, use, actively use the SDGs in their work. And there are ways to do that, ways that are not too complicated, ways that involve stakeholders, that involve citizens, that involve everyone, so that parliaments can provide valuable insights to uh, what is already being done there and be an active partner in this uh, um, in this effort. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kimberly. My one line would be to approach everything with a systems view in terms of the sectors, the stakeholders, and the costs, benefits of action. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Dario. Maria stole my line, so I had to make up one another, a different one. But the, my one line is both UNIC and ESCAP are here to help parliaments uh, drive the path towards Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. We're ready to help. Thanks. And indeed, to do so in close collaboration with the uh, Interparliamentary Union. And I'd like to uh, end this event by thanking um, all of you, first of all, as especially the honorable members of parliament for finding time to join us today. We had good attendance from across uh, the two regions. Secondly, to thank um, my, my dear colleagues at ESCAP and uh, uh, IPU, and of course the EC team, um, uh, for the great collaboration and making this event a success. Uh, I'd like to especially thank our, our panelists, uh, Kimberly, Maria, and Dario. Um, and finally, 
uh, well, we all hope that uh, we see each other or interact at the high-level political forum where the Sustainable Development Goal 7 will be amongst those in review. And then, of course, we're looking forward to the SDG Summit when, when the world will take stock of the mid, mid, midway progress on SDGs. We know, we know that um, the uh, uh, progress is, is unfortunately limited, but we do know that parliaments can make a real difference when it comes to SDG achievement. Uh, and, and also looking at the, at the results of the second poll, um, we see that more information, more data is needed, and we will work collectively to help address the existing gaps. Uh, with this, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me ask the, the, the moderation team to pr project the final poll of today, which is feedback on this event. Have you found it useful? We'll end with that. We hope this was useful for you, and we look forward to continuing uh, to continuing engaging in this platform um, that is uh, hosted by IPU, SCAP, and UNIC. Thank you very much, and have a very nice day. And thank you very much for the very nice feedback. All the best.